Welcome everyone to the second part of a conversation with the Reverend Dr. James Lawson. Um, so many people know him most recently from the very moving funeral for John Lewis here in Atlanta at Ebenezer Baptist Church. In our first conversation, however, we talked about uh, Dr. Lawson's earlier life and the centrality of an understanding of Jesus and God and the Bible as a person, a witness, and a text for the life of nonviolence and the power of love. And uh, we simply quoted from uh, a history book that says that American history was changed in terms of the course of American history in 1960 and 61 by doing what James Lawson taught his students to do, and then the Nashville campaign and the Freedom Bus Rides of May 1961. So we get to talk with the person who taught those and who himself participated in changing the course of American history. And one of the things that uh, we talked about in the first session, and now we'll, we'll get to the next one, to this one, was a quoting uh, one of uh, Dr. Lawson's students, Diane Nash, who was a student with, James, uh, with John Lewis. And she said that there was only one outcome acceptable, and that was the elimination of segregation. And a huge step toward that outcome was that we changed ourselves. We changed ourselves into people who could not be segregated. Yes. So in this session, we're gonna talk uh, about that and John Lewis. So welcome back, uh, James Lawson. Mm -hmm. Glad you're with us. Thank you very much for this extended conversation. You're quite welcome, Ed. Mm -hmm. So Jim, let's talk about those sessions Kelly Miller Smith invited you to his church in Nashville. You were the secretary, the field secretary for the Fellowship of Reconciliation. He invited you to come and speak, and you spoke. God bless you. And then he, um, you announced that there would be a series of workshops on Tuesday nights at uh, a Methodist church near the college campus, and John Lewis felt like he should come and join you at the Clark Memorial United Methodist Church. And he says about that, uh, that there is a force beyond ourselves, a force that is right and moral, the force of righteousness, righteous truth, that is at the basis of human conscience, that changes us and touches and changes those around us as well and that force is love, and he learns something new. Jim, if you don't mind, talk, please, about the content, the core. Talk a little bit about the core of those workshops. He All said right, you um, introduced okay. them to everybody. All right, Ed. Yes. Uh, there's a prior story. Okay, great. The hundred or so clergy with a number of lay people who thoroughly supported Southwise, at least, the Montgomery bus boycott and Martin King, also became the founding members of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Okay. That dedicated itself to what they called the redeeming of the soul of America. Wow. That was the motto. Its primary purpose then was to repeat what happened in Montgomery with other nonviolent campaigns as the only way by which this business of racism and segregation could be effectively challenged and dismantled. Uh, I traveled with Dr. King often. What happened to the students in Nashville in terms of the teaching also happened to the students in 
Little Rock, the Nine. But it yes. also happened to Martin Luther King Jr. in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference because I became the major teacher of nonviolence to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Martin King in January also of 1958, where I did my first workshop for Dr. King in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, I think it was, at the first annual meeting of uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So I need to put that on the table. Secondly, there was in SCLC and its supporters an anxiety that it must happen again. What happened in Montgomery must be demonstrated again and again but we have to have another major campaign of nonviolence that shows nonviolence is not an accident out of Montgomery. And uh, by, the, by September of 58, uh, I've been traveling around many of the hot spots and counseling and supporting the development of SCLC and all of its meetings and its development of staff. I realized that the second major campaign of nonviolence had to happen in Nashville where I lived and had to be organized and strategized by me. That that was the best way for that second campaign to occur. So Kelly Miller Smith had the Nashville Christian Leadership Council an affiliate of the SCLC. I was made an executive member of that in early January or February of 1958. I came back to Kelly and the National Christian Leadership Council and said, if this is going to happen, a second major campaign, we have to do it in Nashville. They agreed. That's all we voted to do a campaign. And The executive committee also voted that I should do the organizing of it. And the executive committee agreed that we would begin in January of 1959. So, so I began planning and organizing and understand this is something that I'd never done on a, on a citywide basis. But anyway, I decided I would follow a four step Gandhian process. That four-step Gandhian process, as a number of people developed it in the United States by that time, uh, I called focus, step one, step two, um, negotiations, step three, direct action campaign, step four, the follow-up. The follow-up, of course, meaning that the direct action campaign works And so the organization has to see to it that everything that we agreed to do in the the process would be carried out. So in any case, we started planning in November, December, January, we had our first meeting on a Saturday morning and we agreed that we would be meeting every Saturday Saturday morning. Um, This was in the focus stage. The focus stage is that you can't do everything you may want to do. You have to focus on a sort of singular campaign. Yes. Yeah. We did six months of talking once a week. And after the first three months of assessing all the issues that concerned black people in Nashville, we then went back over that laundry list to determine where we would begin a nonviolent campaign. And the decision was made that we would desegregate downtown Nashville. Now, there were elements of desegregation of the downtown Montgomery in the Montgomery bus boycott. But Nashville is the first place where a group of black people put on the national agenda the desegregation of public life. Now, recall quite briefly that all over Nashville and much of the south central part of the country and the southeastern part of the country were very immoral signs that people lived by. Over water fountains, 
that said white only <laughs> or colored <laughs> water. <laughs> Restrooms, white only, colored only. And the term used was very often colored, not Negro. Colored being the preference term for racism. And uh, this was true in many parts of the country. There were no dirty Irish signs in some parts of the northeastern part of the country. There were no WAP signs in Pennsylvania. There were no wetback signs, no mech signs, no chink signs, no Jew signs. No Jew and no Negro signs all over the United States. These signs were by custom and by the spread of racism, uh, by the political and economic powers allowing reconstruction not to happen, <laughs> and thereby subjecting the nation to the impact of the plantation owners and the KKK and to the notion that the slaves were all subhuman. The ex-slaves were subhuman. And that is what then uh, pushed the nation into the 20th century towards becoming a segregated society based upon the complexion of human skin. So what powerful history. Thank you. Keep going. Keep going. Well, the Nashville movement made the decision we will desegregate downtown. So for the first time in the so-called civil rights movement uh, of the nation going on, occurred the notion we will desegregate public life in America. And from my perspective of organizing, that meant the signs would all come, do <coughs> come down. Separate waiting rooms would be renovated into single waiting rooms and so forth and so on. And I prepared then the strategic plan, namely that in September we would recruit people from the community and from the co college campuses to uh, do the preparation workshops in which we would do deep preparation in nonviolent theory and practice and deep preparation in nonviolent behavior. How do you handle racist abuse, verbal? How do you handle racist assault that's physical? Uh, because my sense, and I'm sure that C.T. Vivian and Kelly Miller-Smith and Andrew White and Johnetta Hayes and others all agreed with me that we had to have a disciplined movement that could take the worst that the racism and the segregation could throw at us as we challenged it and not strike back, not hit back, not repeat the hatred, the evil. So we, we said uh, deep preparation. We did not have a specific calendar, but my, uh, in my own mind, we were looking to start the first public demonstrations then in 1960. We met once a week for two or three hours, as you've already said, Ed, uh, at Clark Memorial Methodist Church. Yeah. A black congregation right on the edge of Fisk. We met there because it was easier for Fisk students and Tennessee State students to get to that spot. That's why we chose that spot. So even choosing a, prop, a place for preparation is a part of the strategy, is the point I would make about that. I understand. In, in, in any case, um, it, it should be said that we, we had probably somewhere between 20 and 30 people from the beginning, relatively small, but, not, but, but large enough to really make an impact. And I wasn't concerned about the size because I had every sense ability that once we started the public campaigns, we would have no trouble recruiting other people <laughs> and helping them to be ready to join it, which of course was what happened. Uh, we had no basic book because uh, Gandhi was not a systematic thinker. 
and I had to go from my own study and reading across 10 years. Um, one of the major things I wanted people to understand was that, as the old folks used to say, each person in that group was a gift of God. Uh -huh. They had the gift of life. They had the gift of power. Um, because all social action and political action, and religious action, begins with uh, the persons who develop it and who get involved in it. Um, you cannot have a good football team unless every single player of the 22 players on the team thoroughly know their position and do all the homework, the exercise, the running, <laughs> the practice that allows them to effectively handle that position. Right. No team can become a team <laughs> without that personal commitment to competency, <laughs> to consecration, <laughs> to dedication. And the athletic uh, model was one of the models I used early on uh, in, in my work. So I did begin with the Bible, with Jesus, um, but um, uh, I pushed very hard that uh, every person was created in the image and design of God. Ma uh, the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis, 26, 27, 28, I think it is, um, that each person gifted with the imagery and likeness of God. And that meant that we human beings were more powerful than what we knew because we were almost like a single electrical or nuclear generator. We had all the potential of life given us from birth. The only living species that really had that much life bestowed from creation. <laughs> and so part of my task was to help people recognize that all the definitions of racism, all the definitions of sexism, all the definitions that excluded human beings, despised human beings, were absolutely wrong. And that from a nonviolent perspective, as from a Jesus perspective, we had to tap the great gifts that life gave us at birth. And this is part of the reason why John Lewis writes in the book that uh, uh, I helped people to have life. I gave them life. I saved his life is the way I think he writes it. That's in right. First chapter. But I, I, I do not say I saved his life. That's his word. Right, right. I say that I offered, offered them an understanding of religious, biblical faith that helped them to tap the great gift of life that God had given them. And this is one of the things that seems to me that Christianity has not done also. Uh, right. The, the, that Christianity hasn't helped people to understand that your birth is a gift of God, is in itself miraculous, uh, and in, a, in and of itself is the way life has its greatest power to change and to work. Uh, so I went over the his, Exodus Bible, Exodus story, uh, the Luke story of Jesus. I I explain some of the ways in which Jesus was a um, nonviolent practitioner. His, especially uh, Matthew five through se chapters five through seven, especially Matthew five thirty eight to forty eight, uh, forty three rather to 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 forty eight. I think because of forty three, the last pericope of uh, chapter five of, of Matthew. Uh, there, I don't know how well I've helped people to understand it, but there I tried to see that not so much as a, 
um, Jesus' e, um, uh, denunciation of war or violence. I saw it rather as a toolkit that Jesus said you could have ways of working with your enemy and your opponent, ways of overcoming the evil one, uh, nonviolently overcoming the evil one. Uh, and I know that I used one specific illustration of that, and that is the story of Jesus says, if someone forces you to go one mile, go two miles. Uh, by that time, I happen to come, have come to the conclusion that this is something that happened to Jesus. A and we know from anthropology now and archaeology that the Roman Empire had a rule that said that any time a Roman official or a um, Roman soldier uh, walked the street somewhere in the big vast empire, and they met a indigenous person, they could demand that that indigenous person carry their pack for one mile. We know that that was a law in the Roman Empire. So it, it's not an accident then that Jesus uses that in his little discussion of tactics. Right. If anyone forces you to go one mile, you go to two miles. And I, by that time, was teaching that Jesus at age 14 or 15, as a carpenter, as a person doing woodwork like his father, and by 14, 15, 16, already working uh, with his father and then on his own as a skilled workman, was met with a legionnaire who demanded he walk, take his pack for one mile. And I propose that the way to understand it was to understand that Jesus was at first angry when he took the pack from the legend, legionnaire, but then as in his, in his anger, he ban, began looking at his companion that he was walking next to or behind, discovered that the companion, that this soldier was not much older than he was, that he was very dark skinned. He was an Ethiopian. And as Jesus walks, he realizes this is a, a fellow human being and he asks the boy, where do you come from? The, the guy who was his own age, an adult, teenager. And so begins a conversation. And so begins Jesus' recognition that this soldier, uh, just one or two years older than he is, <laughs> is an, a human being. Yes. And they pass the one mile mark. And the soldier says, you've gone with me one mile. And Jesus said, yeah, but we're having a good visit. <laughs> we have recognized our common humanity. And so I'm going to walk with you another mile as we continue our visit. And so I maintain that Jesus, as an early teen, working as, a hum as an adult, having worked with his father from age three or four or five and learned all the tools his father used in the woodwork he did and becoming then a companion to his father at a very early age and learning the skills from his dad uh, that uh, uh, Jesus um, was not giving us some impractical tactic right he was giving us tactics that he himself had learned to use in an occupied country. Yes. And in a country where he had to learn to live under forces that he felt were in contradiction to his own humanity. Yes. You know, so it, uh, the uh, Sermon on the Mount in my mind is a um, book about tactics, mm. way to think way to discover them in tough situations, the way to fight enmity and wrong and to find creative ways to overcome. So I, I weighed heavily on that. I told the story 
of the uh, Chicago sit-in around 1942, because that was going to be the tactic we would use. I, of course, rehearsed some of the story of Gandhi in South Africa, and Gandhi is the person who uh, coined the term nonviolence. And later then, uh, invented the term with help from his supporters, invented the term satyagraha or satyagraha, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Um, this came out of South Africa. It's in South Africa around 1609 that Gandhi chooses the term nonviolence. He writes in a book that I just looked at this morning again, which I purchased in 1942 in India, or purchased in India, that was written in 1942 in India, published rather. Uh, Gandhi speaks of how he took the ancient Sanskrit word ahimsa, which had often in the old world been translated as no injury, do no harm, do no injury. Gandhi writes that he took that term and translated it as nonviolence, that he did this in South Africa. He did not like the term passive resistance. He did not like the term non-resistance, which were used by Christians in England and South Africa. He did not like the term pacifism. Um, he liked no, none of those terms. So he thought that he had to invent his own language for explaining that which he was calling nonviolence. Gandhi himself, I maintained, uh, picked up this idea because of the night that he calls the most creative experience of his life. He went to South Africa as a lawyer for a Muslim corporation. He ostensibly went only for one year, but in the first week he has to go to Pretoria by train uh, to do a part of the work that he had agreed to do. He was given by his employer a first-class ticket or a first-class compartment on the train. He rode comfortably until the first stop which was in the mountainous area before Pretoria in a place called Maritz, Maritzburg. Very cold, it was in the winter. There he was accosted by a white traveler, white male traveler who said, you can't be in this car. This car is only for white people. Gandhi said, no, this is my ticket. I'm in the seat, I'm in the compartment where my ticket says I should be. That fellow traveler goes and gets a conductor and conduct, conductor comes and Gandhi again has his ticket and clings to it, will not give it up, says, no, my ticket says this is where I am to ride. And so finally they are joined, the two white men are joined by at least a third white man, man and they pick up Gandhi and his baggage and throw him onto the platform of this uh, uh, Maritzburg uh, station. Uh, he is uh, totally upset. It says he remained angry the whole night. And what he was angry about was the abdrunk mistreatment. And he knew that it was a pattern that he would find in, in South Africa. And he had to determine what to do about it. He decided to resist, but he decided that he could not resist this wrong in a way similar to the wrong. Mm. And some of the books claim that Jainism, his mother's faith, and the Jainism that, is, that was the faith of a nanny that he had as a child, 
on do no wrong, Ahimsa influenced him most. And he decided that the way to handle this was through Ahimsa. Do no wrong. Don't repeat the wrong. Don't do an eye for an eye. Overcome the evil with good. So thus is born in him the seed that becomes what he calls nonviolent. Nonviolence. And I maintain that Gandhi around 1909, 1906, is the one who first coins the term nonviolence and makes it the foundation of his developing political and spiritual struggle against the British Empire, against the racism he met in South Africa, and for the independence of his country, India. Uh, after the first campaigns in 1906, the great marches, the great jail-ins that took place between 1906 and 1909, uh, Gandhi still is wanting to improve upon the language of this thing. And so he has started a newspaper called The Indian Opinion. And he writes in that instant paper that they need another name for this movement, for this struggle. And he makes a contest in the Indian opinion. He gets a variety of responses from his audience, largely an Indian audience. And he is, um, uh, he, he is given the word um, um, satya, uh, a word meaning that means, that can mean truth and soul. And he adds graha to it. And so comes up with the term Satyagraha, uh, S-A-T-Y-A-G-R-A-H-A. And he then began to use that term um, to say, to describe his struggle and his the theory and practice. Firmness uh, in truth. And for Gandhi, God is truth. Uh, tenacity in truth. And it's, it's my contention, uh, it was my contention in the 60s even, that Satyagraha could be translated in terms of God force, love force, soul force, spirit force, truth force. And in Gandhi's language, all of those terms he used <laughs> To describe his work, his own work, his own life, and his camp, his and the various many campaigns that he presided over or um, um, counseled, uh, trained the people to do it in different parts of India, and then kept an eye on it as they did the particular strike or boycott or other things that they did uh, in India. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of campaigns around India. Um, uh, many of which he trained the people who did them and then kept an eye on them, had his people keep an eye on them and work with them. So I uh, also used then the independence movement, the SALT March, a great demonstration of nonviolent struggle and a stroke of, stroke of genius in the part of Gandhi, uh, taking a simple thing like the British SALT tax in India and making it a vehicle that number one, um, the British uh, governors thought this was foolish and would never work. But by the time Gandhi uh, on the shore of the Indian Ocean picked up a little bit of sand and salt and said salt, thereby defying and breaking the British law, it became the rallying cry all over the country. Um, people made salt. Seven seven thousand or more people were thrown in jail. Eventually, King uh, Gandhi was thrown in jail, with along with his wife and many of his followers, Nehru and others. But it rattled uh, the occupation of India, British Empire. It was probably in that march, and through the aftermath of that salt campaign 
that then what Gandhi had told the people initially when he went back to India in 1914 came true because he told the people of India that the British are here only because we have consented to it. And the first task of independence has to be that we, the people of India, withdraw our consent for the British to be in control of India, and thereby to tell the British they must go home and leave us to our own government and work. And so that salt mark, mark um, what, six years later, 20, uh, maybe 16 years later, uh, does what exactly what Gandhi says has to happen. Uh, the British come to learn in the British colonial office the um, uh, um, forgotten what they called him, the, the, the man who governed India for the British colonial office, all came to recognize that the, their time in India as a colony was over. It was just a question of when they would acknowledge it legally <laughs> and on paper and then do it, make it happen. So Jim, I just want to feed back to you uh, a relearning I've just had that withdrawing consent to injustice and oppression is the first step that has to be taken in the human soul and also a commitment to doing that nonviolently so that you discover the humanity and the soul in the person who's perpetuating the oppression and the injustice. Yes? Well, there's a whole group of 19th century, 18th century philosophers, including Edmund Burke, yes. who was read by the founding fathers of the United States, who, who write, who make the motion that the tyrant can only operate if he has the consent of the people over which he, uh, uh, over which he rules. Uh, so Gandhi has agreed to a, actually a, an old political principle that the consent of the governed has to be a reality if the t any government is to have power. Well, um, this, brings, this brings me back to Diane Nash saying that, that she was changed to be a person who would not be segregated. Yes, that's right. That's right. So because of our time, mm -hmm. if you'll take us from, I mean, I, I've been spellbound by that teaching you just gave me. I had a sense of what was going on in those workshops that you had with those college students. Once you had focused on desegregating public life in downtown Nashville, and you were going to do it with these students who were being prepared in understanding the importance of withdrawing their consent and also doing it nonviolently. And then a challenge. I mean, you, you actually challenge things. And because of our time, I want us to talk about the, the, the essence of what you were saying at John Lewis's funeral, which you were, you were saying, we've got to go deeper than bipartisan politics. Yeah. We've got to go deep down to the constitution I mean, it was really brilliant what you were saying there. So say whatever you need to say about the Nashville movement, which is the second major nonviolent civil yeah, rights movement. Yeah. And uh, I, sh I should tell you that now as I teach this at uh, UCLA and at Cal State Northridge, um, I list the nonviolent campaign as from 1953 to 1973. 
And within that period of time, you have the Freedom Ride, you have the Mississippi Summer, you have the Albany Campaign, you have the Washington March, you have the uh, 1967 March Against Fear in Mississippi. You have the massive voting rights campaigns. The voting registration was almost a southern wide demand by all kinds of people, organized and unorganized. But it was uh, uh, in in that the, that twenty year period, you get the organization of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which uh, Martin King and Ella Baker and I were the people who organized the meeting and who uh, helped to found the student nonviolent organizing, uh, student nonviolent uh, SNCC. SNCC. And Jim, you were teaching all the way through this. Oh, through, yeah. Through oh, these yeah. 20 years. Yes. Oh, yeah. 1953 to 1973, you were yeah. doing the teaching. Yes. Of, doing the deep preparation That's of right. the people who were doing the action. I, I, I was in mo many of the campaigns myself. Participated often in the background, yeah, but uh, I was often physically there, right, in many of the campaigns. So, Jim, okay. let's go. Go so, ahead. All yes. right. So, uh, for 1959, 1960, 1961, 1962, John's major base is in. Nashville, John Lewis's major base. He is a part of what I called our central committee. The central committee was the strategic executing and planning arm of the direct action. The National Christian Leadership Conference was the parent body and we did things together. <laughs> National Christian Leadership Conference took care of the budgets and the money and whatnot. We did just the strategic work. We met sometimes night and day to make certain that our direct action campaigns would go forward and would go forward with high degree of discipline. And I use that period of time as a kind of continuing laboratory on nonviolence. That is, Central Committee would talk about the nonviolent character of the demonstration we just finished. Uh, of the day of civil disobedience, February 27th, 1960. We would analyze these, and I would analyze them from the philosophy and from biblical faith, biblical scripture, as, and from the work of Jesus and Gandhi, as well as then from the practicality of the moment in which we found ourselves. Amazing. So, so that became a kind of laboratory for John and for Diane and for a great number of others, C.T. Vivian, and I should say that in these workshops, in the pictures we have in Force More Powerful, there are pictures of clergy who are there in the workshop. C.P. Vivian is in the workshop. Yeah, yeah. Alexander Anderson is a pastor. He's pastor of Clark Memorial Church. Mm -hmm. um, 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 a Presbyterian minister wearing his collar is there. Uh, there, there, there are a number of adults and clergy. The workshops, we recruited students. John Lewis was recruited by Kelly Miller Smith, his teacher at ABC. Right. And yes. John recruited Bernard Lafayette. Yes. Uh, I recruited Diane Nash through Paul LaProd, huh. who was a fellow student at Fisk and who called me about something going on and I told him our plans and said, come. Then he told me about Diane and I said, you invite Diane to come to the workshop because we are organizing the campaign that will satisfy her angst. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, and, her, and her brilliance. Yeah, that's right. So, so uh, um, um, it, it was an organized uh, effort on part of the community and an intergenerational community. Right, right. So one needs to understand that. 
I'm really not happy. Sure I got all of your question in that. No, that was perfect. I, I, I didn't know about the Central Coordinating Committee. I didn't understand that you all were Central Committee, that you were doing strategy and discipline and preparation. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Behind we planned things. We planned every sit-in. Amazing. We planned the marches on the theaters. Yeah. We planned to continue the Freedom Ride and recruit it, made the Freedom Ride Army, it came out of the Central Committee that I... Uh, it, it's carried out simple piece of work of nonviolence that when you get a nonviolent campaign going on, oftentimes you have to provide the structure that helps you to execute the issues. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Very often conventional structures will not allow that to happen. So you have to create a new structure that will help you do that work for that campaign. <laughs> So and that became a kind of a model of campaigns like uh, Albany, Georgia, and Birmingham, and St. Augustine, Florida, and Danville, right. Virginia campaigns. Brilliant. And thank God for you and all of that work. Well, we, because of our time, we must, we must go to the eulogy at John Lewis's funeral. And you covered so much material in that. I think my question is, what was the what was the takeaway essence you wanted us who were listening and clinging on your words to take away? Well, certainly one of those is what you have already mentioned, where my whole whole emphasis on that John Lewis played the politics out of his nonviolent understanding, sought to be a political figure of the Constitution of the Declaration of Independence. Yes. I could have gone further, but I left out that John Lewis tried to do the politics of the kingdom of God on oh. earth. Yeah. That he tried to do the politics of Jesus. Because that again is one of my problems with Christianity. Christianity allows itself to be conditioned by the society in which it lives rather than allowing itself to be conditioned by the kingdom of God, which is Jesus' made major teaching point as in, and is in the Jesus prayer. <laughs> so we allow ourselves to get governed by human politics rather than by the politics of Jesus. Yes. So I was, I'm, I'm pushing very hard these days about this issue because I maintain that the alternative to Trump and the Trump forces in our history is not bipartisan politics, but the politics of the Declaration of Independence and the politics of the Constitution of the United States, especially the multiple visions, the multiple visions that are available through the preamble, where big words are used. <laughs> to, per, to uh, perform a more perfect union. Well, visualize that. That's, that that uh, 330 people can be a more perfect union. Not necessarily never becoming the same. Right. But all having a vision of a nation where we are one people. Right. And where we are one people under God, where we want access to every boy and girl yeah. of our society. We yeah. Are, a system of education that allows every boy and girl to seize hold of life and to tap its great potential. So, um, big words, establish justice is the, is the third phrase or fourth phrase, establish justice. Well, my goodness, we don't, have never had political parties that talk about justice. Yeah. Justice, which requires we dismantle old tyrannies. We dismantle tyrannies, which we have presupposed were essential. <laughs> yeah. In the light of our own historic beginning. Yep. Uh, so I, I maintain that bipartisan politics is insufficient with, because after all, we are the first people that organized a country around poetic scriptural goals. We hold these truths. We the people of the USA. 
No other nation has begun like that up until right. the United States. Yeah. It's, it's almost an impossible to imagine that kind of a stroke in history, but also the um, peculiar creative demands that that kind of history represents. Right. Oh, Jim. Oh, okay. So the last content question, and then we have to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had all these people say, what was that Jim Lawson talking about when he said plantation capitalism? Uh -huh. So defend yourself, Jim Lawson. <laughs> well, the major form of economics that the Western exploration uh, and conquest period looked at around the world was how we can, how we can uh, gather wealth from North America, from Africa, from Portugal, I mean from uh, Peru, Brazil. So uh, a major economic force was the, were the people who came to the United States insisting they were going to be rich and powerful, who, who uh, created great plantations, large, large land holdings, and established slavery. So I maintain that that is the first order of our history, whether we like it or not. It was not capitalism. It was plantation capitalism. And plantation cap capitalism is what our present society is. We worship the men who have in less than 30 years acquired becoming the richest men on earth. <laughs> yeah. We worship that. And that becoming the richest men on earth and gathering property also um, means that a lot of people get paid poor wages. Plantation capitalism is what Walmart's is. It's what Amazon is. The billions of dollars that the owners have accumulated the billions of dollars have come at the expense of the people who do the work. So the average wages, for an example, in McDonald is $9 an hour. <laughs> Poverty wages. While any number of people in the McDonald Corporation has become millionaires and billionaires. That's plantation capital. So at the heart of plantation capitalism is the notion that the workers are slaves and should not share the wealth that they produce. And when you do that in the United States, you have to also then become very anti-union because in the 20th century, labor union organizing is what gave workers their best income across some 50 year period. Yeah. Um, so plantation capitalism is what we establish and it's what prevails. We have an economic order that produces high levels of poverty. And our power brokers have never made the eradication of poverty a major economic goal for the nation. Uh, Europe is about twice the size of the United States in population, it does not ha have any of the um, uh, standards of poverty or illiteracy <laughs> or lack of medical care that we have produced in our United States. Um, so plantation capital is my analysis. We have never had 
we've never had a John, a um, Adam Smith form of capitalism because Adam Smith um, suggests that um, real capitalism is an economy that is largely in the hands of ordinary families who produce all kinds of wealth. Uh, we have a far more monopolistic capitalism. Um, we don't have newspapers owned by people in um, city after city or village after village. We have newspapers owned by big conglomerates. Yeah. Monopoly is a favorite form of economic growth in our USA economy. Um, not creativity, even in the technology field. Uh, giant ownership, giant wealth is the major model. Um, so all of that is what I mean by capitalism, plantation capital. And plantation capitalism is extremely male chauvinistic against women and extremely racist because it gained much of its wealth and power through slavery and through the poverty of working people in the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, and one of the interesting things about plantation capitalism is that in the 19th century in the United States, the southeastern portion of our nation was the wealthiest portion of our nation. Where the plantations were, <laughs> and the cotton was, <laughs> was the wealth. Yeah. It's only in the, ninth, in, only in the 20th century that um, other sections of the country have become uh, more, be and in large measure, other sections of the country have become better because they have tended to eliminate, they have tended to work against working people working for nothing. Yes. <laughs> New York, even Ohio, um, forces that have moved away from the misuse of working people and towards quality education. So Jim Lawson, I have to thank you now and wrap this up. I am so grateful. I feel like I have actually attended a workshop that John Lewis said changed his life. Mm -hmm. And I'm deeply grateful, not only for these moments, uh, but also for your life, not only in the past, but your teaching now at UCLA and uh, Cal State Northridge. And are you still doing your Saturday workshops at Holman? Yes, I do a Saturday workshop at Holman. I love it. I Zoom. <laughs> Zoom your workshops. Yeah. I love it. Yes, and I do consult consultation with labor unions and with other groups of people still. And, and Jim, I think you've turned beyond 90. Yes, I'm 91. I'll be 92 next month, September 22nd. Happy birthday, Jim. Thank you. I'm really grateful for our friendship. I'm grateful for your teaching me. I'm grateful for our collegiality when I was in Los Angeles. And I'm yes. grateful for this time. It's quite mutual, Ed. Wonderful kinship and, and many good works. Yes. Many Very good much. works. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Ed. And thank you all for joining with us.